Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? Okay. So first announcement. Is that the midterm is the week after we come back? Or the week the week that we we do come back. So it's March twenty third. Which is a Thursday. From seven PM. 8.15 p.m. Which is to say, when you come back from, from the break, it'll be the first Thursday that occurs. Okay. Now, notably, it's uh, uh, Thursday night at 7. So in particular, it's not during lecture. <laughs> also, it's not at the testing center. It'll be in a room, uh, and I'll give you an announcement where that room is. And the way it'll be is that I'll make a grade, you know, air quotes, grade in the grade book, and that'll be the room that you go to. It'll be called something like exam one room or something. So the reason why we have to do it that way is because it's going, the exam is going to occur, is going to occur in multiple rooms simultaneously. Uh, and some of you will go to the one room, some of you the other, etc. Okay. So the way the exam will go is that by the time of the exam, you will have completed quiz seven. Quiz seven, I think, is due on Saturday in four days or something. Okay. So by the time of the exam, you will you will have completed quiz seven. The exam will cover the topics on, uh, on up to and including quiz seven. So each quiz has three exercises, but only two of those three are graded, and I don't inform you in advance which two, but you know afterward. So by the time, so a few days from Saturday, quiz seven will be graded. You'll have 14 quiz grades in the gradebook, 14 individual quiz exercises. Um, the, the way the midterm exam will go is that everyone will come in, you'll complete three or four exercises, and everyone has to do these three or four. Then, once you've done however many the mandatory part is, you turn those in, and then you can select up to six of the 14 quiz questions that you've already done for, to, to redo. Now, they won't be exactly the same, okay, but they'll be quite similar. So, you might look in the gradebook and say, oh, I didn't do very well on quiz three, question two. And it would be in my interest if I could improve my grade on quiz three, question two. So that should be one of the six that you select. Okay, so I want you to go through the gradebook and over all your quizzes, and I want you to figure out what would be in your best interest to be able to redo. And then you can bring, you can make that determination and bring a list of those six quizzes, six exercises to the exam. And I don't mean you can bring six keys, I mean you can write down the list. I want to do quiz three, question two, I want to do quiz four, question one, etc. So that when you go up to make your selections, you say you know exactly which ones you want. Okay, so then. What's the optimal strategy for such a scenario? The optimal strategy is more or less the following, that you need, to, you need to review all of the quizzes and figure out, oh, it really would be best if I could improve my score on, say, quiz three, question two. Because the rule is going to be, if, for example, you do a redo quiz three, question two, then I'll have two measurements. The first time you took quiz three, question two, and this redo time, you can have the better of the two. Okay? So, what you need to do is you need to look at all the questions and say, these are the six that, that would be best for me. Now, one way they might be best for you is just numerically. 
right? Like if I could just if I could just max out these six questions, that'd be terrific. Okay, but you also need to consider what is how do you estimate the likelihood that you can achieve that, <laughs> achieve that <laughs> on the midterm, right? Sitting there. So maybe you might say, well, I really would like to redo question quiz four, question two, but actually I'm not so sure that I'm gonna that I'm gonna be able to do that. So instead I'm gonna do whatever. Now the purpose of this is the following, the teaching purpose, the pedagogical purpose, is that I really don't care, personally, uh, what, you, what you know at a specific time in the midst of the semester. So I'm not really so concerned if you can't answer a question that I posed to you in week three. I'm not really so concerned. I, I am a little concerned in the sense that, that that usually is correlated with problems answering questions in week four. That's a problem. But supposing you couldn't answer the question in week three, then on the midterm you can answer it. It's fine by me. All that I really care is that by the time you exit, you can answer the, the question. Okay, so that's the, the reason for such a system. Okay, so it'll be like, it'll be like going to the post office. If you've ever been there with P.O. boxes, you've got all the little cubby holes everywhere. There'll be, there'll be 14 little cubby holes, all labeled quiz five, question one, quiz seven, question three, or whatever. Okay, you select your six, you do them, and you put them in the, the, the turn-in box, which also has all the labels. Okay, any questions about that? And so you said there are four mandatory, mandatory questions, mm -hmm. and those are just four from what we've done so far. From, okay. yeah, from the whole, okay. yeah cumulative over to, n to now. So like if we, so the, the quiz questions we're redoing could potentially replace our grade if we do better mm -hmm. for the quiz, but they don't have any effect on our midterm grade. Right, I've already submitted your midterm grade to the university. Well, I mean like the grade of this exam. Oh, Sorry. I get it now. Uh, no, so, so. The Just the four questions. Well, well, no, not exactly. Okay. So what it is is that quizzes, mm -hmm. qu what a quiz is, is it, it's, a, it's a measurement I'm making that's under a proctored condition, mm -hmm. which is to say that I'm, sh I'm, I'm confident that it was you. Whereas your homework, you know, for all I know, you could just be walking over to the engineering school and just paying one of them $5 <laughs> to do it, you know, so far as I can tell. Okay. So... Okay, that's why homeworks are relatively low weight. So your quiz average is 70% of your course average. And the homework is, the written homework is 15 and the online homework is 15. So you just have a quiz average. So what's, hap what's gonna happen is by the time of the midterm, you'll have 14 quiz measurements. Okay. You can redo up to six. Then, at the midterm, you'll have another four that you're not going to have a chance to redo. So you're going to have to do them right then. Then, we'll do the exact same dance in the last half of the semester, which is to say you will have had another 14 or 16 quiz measurements. You'll have a chance to redo another six or so of those, and another few that you won't have a chance to redo. Then your quiz average will be, you know, out of, out of all those measurements an average. So there's not, there aren't, there, there's not a separate exam grade. Mm -hmm. Every question is graded individually. Other questions? Every question has to be graded individually more or less because that's the only way I can enforce this scheme where I say, okay, student X, you make the determination which six exercises would be best for you. So every question has to be graded individually, not, not, not recorded cumulatively like in an exam. So then where do the four mandatory questions grades go? Grades? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it'll be so just... So it's like, like another quiz. Like those four it's questions like a are quiz. like another quiz. It's like a quiz. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, that makes sense. In the grade book, if we had, if there are some values for quizzes that are numerical and some that are uh, like A, B, C, mm -hmm. what's the difference? 
Okay. So every question, every every question that's written that you that you perform that's written down. That is that is to say, the quizzes and the written homeworks. They're all out of ten. Okay. So so numerically, you could get a B, which means that you made no attempt. So for example, maybe you didn't turn in written homework 37. In such a in such a case, your grade for written homework 37 would be B, which is equivalent, which is numerically equivalent to a zero. But it also means that it, nothing was attempted. Gotcha. Okay. Then, supposing that you did do it, and it was graded, because not all written homeworks are graded. Supposing you did do it, your grade is zero through ten, except ten is recorded as an A. Gotcha. And the reason for that is that if you look at the little bubbles, they've got their numbers in them, and you can't fit a ten in there. Gotcha. So I put an A in there. <laughs> okay. okay. Then, so that's how you could that's how you could get a B. That's how you could get an A. B means blank. A means ten, gotcha. like hexadecimal ten. And then you could get a C also, <laughs> and that means something else entirely. That means complete. So that means that uh, maybe maybe you did turn in written homework thirty seven, uh, which means that you don't have a B. But perhaps uh, that's not one of the ones that was graded. Because we turn in so many written homeworks, I can't actually assign all of them to be graded. Because I, I only have a fixed amount of labor I'm allowed to utilize. In such a case, you'd get a C, which means complete, which is numerically equi equivalent to one out of one possible points. Other questions? Yes? So the four, um, quiz four questions are on the test that aren't quiz questions. Cumulative. Okay, so it's just mm -hmm. in, in the other quiz. Right. And our best bet is to just study our quiz. Yeah. yeah. So so there's kind of two bits to it. As for the as for the redo bit, you should you should look at how you actually did and then make an optimal strategy for you. And say these are the ones. So you also need to study generally because who knows <laughs> what I'll write down on the exam. Not even I know, right? <laughs> Yet. <laughs> okay. Yes? Um, do some of the quizzes contain three uh, parts that are graded? Yeah, one of them does, actually. Like, quiz, quiz two, I think, had all three questions graded because the grader didn't understand. I said, grade, grade these two, and then the grader graded all of them. And so I said, hey, <laughs> you're messing up my flow here. But at any rate, yeah, that one has three. Yeah. Yeah, there, uh, uh, it would, with the exception of that one, only two are graded. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> So, so because of that one that had three, that means that by the time of the exam, you will have you will have fifteen uh, graded quiz exercises. So what's the, page that the, ex the exercise, yeah. Every every exercise is on a single page, and literally the way it'll be, it'll be just like it's a, it's a, it's in a literature sorting box. You'll see, ah, that's that little hole right there, that's the one that has quiz seven, question three, and that's the one I want. And you make your six selections. And then you do them, and then you'll see another literature sorting box that's over there, and then you say, oh, that's where that one goes, and that, that other one goes there. And then I distribute them to the graders, etc. Yes? So would it be like the chance of the six that you pick and the four that you make, would they like ever be the same question? Yeah, it's conceivable. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's the likely, I mean, I can't, I can't really, I, I, what is the likelihood? I might just come up with four completely different questions. Not, not like out of the blue, but stuff that you know. Yeah, so it's conceivable that, that maybe you would want to do 
redo quiz five question two and then I make one of the four mandatory ones also lack quiz five question two that that's conceivable yes at the testing center we could train in a comic card for a calculator uh -huh. can we do that uh, place or can I use this even though uh, yeah that's that's a tough one I get it yeah but you know you got to have a calculator I mean uh, however much you've got to use a calculator so far, that's what it will be like on the exam. I can't remember any exercises where you needed a calculator. I mean, may, may, <laughs> but a lot of people just use them because they make them feel psychologically comfortable. Like, I don't really want to start this exercise unless I have this thing here. <laughs> Regardless of whether or not it ends up being used. Other questions? Okay. So, good, let's get to it. So last time, uh, we were talking about um, solving nonlinear inequalities using the sign chart method. Uh, so let's do one more of those and then move on to a new thing. So please solve with the sign chart. <coughs> the following x minus 4 squared multiplied by x squared minus 16x uh, plus 60 greater than 0. So, <coughs> um, now, so I, it, it explicitly says solve with a sign chart. So, so that means you have to use a sign chart. But to, to be clear, even if I hadn't written that, even if it just said solve, you have no other way to proceed anyway. Right? You couldn't, you know, if you could say multiply it out, collect like terms or something, you couldn't perform enough arithmetic operations, adds and subtracts and multiplies and divides to get it to work. So you must use a sign chart. Uh, that being the case, what is the first step in the sign chart method? Natural domain. <coughs> so what is the natural domain of this inequality? So, what's wrong with things less than zero? Yeah, so it's, it's in fact all the reals. So, <coughs> when teaching, so in a math class, perhaps one surely near the top of important things is just to know what you're doing and, and to be correct but also near the top are the following three rules is that uh, you should repeat yourself that's one of them and the next rule is that you should say the same thing again and the next rule <laughs> is that okay so then now the natural domain is all the reals why is it all the reals Right. What the natural domain represents, that represents all the positions where the inequality can be evaluated at all. So, but wait a second. Let's think here. If the natural domain is all the reals, well, four is a, four is a real number. So what if we evaluate this inequality at four? Well, if we, if we evaluate that factor at four, that'd be zero. And then it doesn't matter what the other one is because we're going to multiply it by zero. So if we evaluate the inequality at zero, it would read zero greater than zero. What's the logical value of that? False. False. So if we plug in four, it's 
false. So it's four in the natural domain. Yes. Yeah, it is. What does it mean to be in the natural domain? Yeah, it just it just can be evaluated without regard to its logical value, true or false. So we're not we're we're finding the natural domain on the way to something else. What are we actually interested in? The solution. The solution. How are the natural domain and the solution related to each other? Other way around. Solutions, have to be in the natural. Solutions must be in the natural domain, because the natural domain is the set of all places where the inequality can be evaluated at all. And the solution is where the evaluation happens to be true, right? So there are items, elements, in the natural domain that are not part of the solution. For example, four. Four is part of the natural domain. It is. This inequality can be evaluated at four. But four is not part of the solution. Why is four not part of the solution? Yeah, because the equation could be evaluated at four, but it evaluates as false. So far in our class, those are the only places where the natural domain won't be everything. So if there's, if notice that in this inequality, we're never performing divisions by any kind of x thing. So it's not, it's inconceivable, not possible that you could divide by zero. So there's no problem there. Furthermore, there's no even radicals. So there's no problem there. So there's no problems at all. So in our class, the only two places where the, where the domain, the natural domain might not be everything is with divisions and even radicals. We'll collect a couple more as by the by the end of the semester, but those are the only two right now. Okay. Good. What's the next step in the net, in the sign chart method? Zero and simplify. So one of these steps is pretty easy on this exercise. Which one is pretty easy? The zero one, right? <laughs> Because the zero part of zero and simplify is to get one of the sides to be zero. And well, one of the sides is already zero. So that's good. And then, because we're trying to uh, construct a sign chart, the simplest, w the simplest kind of thing to, deal with, to, to use for a sign chart is something that's factored as much as possible. So the simplification that we want to do is we want to ask ourselves, is it possible to factor this any further than it presently is? So can you factor it? So that part's already as factored as it, as it gets. How about that part? Can it be factored? Yeah. Into what? Very good. Okay, what's the next step in the sign chart method? Operation. Yeah, so sol now solve the equation. So that's the, that's the name of this step anyway. But wait a second, what equation? I don't see any equations on the page. All I see are inequalities. <laughs> right. So we need to take this one, the output of this step, which is an inequality, and then we need to transform it into the corresponding equality, which is to say, replace that inequality sign with an equal sign. 
So what are the solutions to this equation? Four, six, and ten. <coughs> Which is to say, notice if you plug in four to that factor, that one will be zero, and it, does, it makes no difference what the others are, because the whole thing, the whole left hand side will be zero. Similarly for that one with six. Similarly for that one with ten. Okay. What's the next step? Sign chart, right? This whole this whole method is named after this step. So what the sign chart is, is you draw a number line, and then you plot a bunch of fence posts. So what fence posts do we need to plot? Four, six, and ten. Now those come from here, right? Now, it did not happen on this exercise, but in, in other so exercises it can happen that we could pull fence posts from somewhere else too, besides these. What it, where else could they have come from? Yeah, from breaks in the natural domain. If it had, <coughs> if it had so happened that there were breaks in the natural domain, all of those must also be plotted. So you give me any two non-negative integers, and I can distribute the fence posts in that way. You could say, well, I would really like to have an exercise where there's seven breaks in the natural domain and eight solutions to the, to the equation. And I want them to be in this order or whatever. We can do it. No problem. I also promise to never put that many in, in a single exercise, okay? Four, six, Okay, now what do we do? Uh, ten. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not, not really sure what happened there. <laughs> okay, now what do we do? Test points, right? So how about three, five, <coughs> seven, and eleven? So that is to say, in each region, we're selecting a test point. What are we supposed to do with these test points? Mm -hmm. We take those test points and we evaluate the non-zero side of the zeroed and simplified inequality. So we're going to plug them into there. Okay, which is to say we're going to take the test point and one by one plug it into each factor. So if we plug 3 into the x minus 4 thing, we'll get a negative value, and then we're going to square it. If we plug 3 into there, what do we get? Something negative. And into the last one, something negative. Okay, now, is there any question why the test point 3 evaluates with that sign pattern into that expression. Any question? Because if you can do this part, then you can do the rest. So if, we're, if you have a question here, we must address it now. This is OK. OK, then it's a matter of just doing the rest of them. OK, so 5 into that one. That'd be positive squared, and then negative, and then negative. Now with 7, that would be positive squared, and then positive, and then negative. And then with 11, that would be positive squared, and then positive, and then positive. Any question about why those are the patterns in each region? Okay, so then now in each region, we can come up with the overall sign. So how about in the leftmost region? What's the overall sign? Positive, positive right? <coughs> because positive squared, that'd be positive. 
and then negative would be negative, and then another negative would be positive again. <coughs> so on these sign patterns, all that you're really doing, or, or a way to sort of do it very rapidly, is you just have to count all the negative ones. And if there are an even number of negative ones, the result will be positive, and if there's an odd number, it'll be negative. So one, two, three, four negatives. That'll be positive. And then here, we don't even need to count the positives. Here's one, two negatives. That's even, so that'll be positive. There's one negative, so that'll be negative. And then there's zero negatives, and zero is even. So there'll be positive uh, sign. So what if, there, what if you had a sign pattern with 103 <coughs> negatives? Then it'd be negative. Okay, so then positive, positive again, negative, positive. Okay. So notably, all of the previous examples where we did a sign chart, the regions had alternating sign, which is to say they were all they every time you moved to the right one it changed to the to the other one, like negative, positive, negative, positive, blah blah blah. Notice that these are not alternating. It's positive and then it's positive some more, and then it's negative and then positive. You give me any sequence of the words, positive and negative, and we can make a sign chart exercise that is just like that. Okay. So now we're in a position to make a conclusion. So we carefully took the natural domain the whole number line and cut it into these four pieces. And then we labeled each piece with either the <coughs> label positive or the label negative. And now the answer to the exercise is we want all of one kind. E either we want all the negatives or we want all the positives. So what do we want on this specific exercise? The positive ones. We want the positive regions. Now, why do we want the positive regions in, in, as opposed to the negative ones? Right. Again, just like in the sign in the sign pattern step, where we said, well, we need to know the sign pattern of the zeroed and simplified inequality. The question about which regions we want are also that one. Right. This one is saying. We want, thi we want this zeroed and simplified inequality, this thing, to be greater than zero. So the fact that we want it to be greater than zero, that is telling us that we want the positive regions. A different way to say it, a different way to say it is that, well, if I were to go back in time and edit this exercise and turn that inequality symbol around, then all of these would be turned around, including that one, and in such a case we would want the negative regions. What if you have to um, uh, divide by a ne negative or multiply by a negative and the sign switches? Do you use the original sign at, like on the original equation at the top, or should you still use zero <coughs> and simplified? You have to use the zero and simplified one. Okay. However, however, this method is, is one of its specific design considerations is that you'll never end up multiplying both signs. Because no matter how the original inequality looks, you could have crazy stuff on the left, crazy stuff on the right. The very first thing you're going to do is put everything on one side. And then you, then you, for, all, for, for all further intents and purposes, you're not even treating it like an inequality anymore. <laughs> Okay, so we want the positive regions. Are there any positive regions? Yeah, there's three of them. Uh, so now we need to consider uh, about the endpoints because here's an interval, there's an interval, there's an interval. So for example, the interval four to six. Okay, now there are four intervals between four and six. There's four of them. 
because there's four choices because you need to choose shall I choose shall I have four or not the left endpoint and shall we have six or not the right endpoint so you need to make a decision about the endpoints so are the endpoints in the natural domain yes because everything is in the natural domain are the endpoints four and six part of the solution How do, you, how do you, in the end, what is the test? What is the, how do you confirm or deny? And then, and if you plug in 6 to x, it's 0, and one of the values, it's not greater than 0. Right. So let's consider 6, like you say. If we were to plug 6 into this inequality here, then that factor would be 0, and it makes no difference what the others are. <coughs> if you plug in 6, this whole thing is 0, and the inequality reads... 0 greater than 0. True or false? False. So 6 is not part of the solution. Alternatively, I could say it like this. What small edit could I make to this exercise so that 6 would, in fact, be part of the solution? Right. If I was to go back in time and put or equal right there, then all of these would become or equal. And at that point, that, this one would be or equal. And when we plug in 6, it would read 0 greater or equal 0, which is true. Okay. So we're not going to include any of the endpoints. So what's the answer then? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to write an answer that is quite common. But I, you, you were going to say the right thing. But I'm gonna, now I'm going to write the wrong thing. Here, here is an answer that's quite common, but mistaken. Nearly right. Not right. So what's wrong with it? It includes 4. Notably, 4 is in that interval, the interval from negative infinity to 6. But we just got finished talking about 4. If you plug 4 in there, the inequality reads 0 greater than 0, which is false. So this is wrong. Students do this because they see the plus and then some more plus, and they think, nah, I'm not going to write that extra stuff in there. Forget it. I'm just going to, you know, who knows what anyone is actually thinking, but that's what I imagine. Okay, so this is wrong. Because that part's not right. Rather, the correct answer is negative infinity to 4 union 4 to 6 union 10 to infinity any question any question about it okay so now uh, one other thing comes to mind is that is that um, some students have expressed concern that some of the written homeworks exercises do not appear to be strongly related to what's happening in the lecture. Okay, I can, I can appreciate that it may be that way. It may seem that way. But I, I promise you, from my point of view, they're all extremely related. Like, I'm pretty sure I made, I made a written homework exercise just like this do Monday when you come back from the break. It's really quite similar, <laughs> honestly. Okay, and the same thing about the ones today. Okay, so that being said, okay, please come to my office and ask me questions prior to the exercises being due. Please come to my office. Because with just a little bit you know, it, it won't take me long for me to ask you just a couple questions, and then I'll figure out where you are and what direction you need, you need to go, and I'll, I'll help you get pointed in the right direction and say, go that way. And it really doesn't take long. Okay. Now, professionally, you know, I could say something like, and I want you to come to my office because I'm interested in your success. Okay, sure, I agree with that. Okay, but anytime you hear someone say something like, I'm interested in your success, 
for altruistic reasons, you, that you should hold that to be highly suspect, right? D honestly, okay. People are interested in their own interests. <laughs> so let me turn it around and just be quite clear. And that is that I want you to come to my office because I want you to do good. And the reason is flatly that my numbers look better when you do good. That's the reason I want you to come to my office. It's purely selfish. Purely selfish. Please come to my office. Okay. Let me put you on the right trajectory so that you can do well on the exam so that my numbers look good. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, purely selfish, I promise you. Now, that being said, also, I think I do have an altruistic streak in me, and I really just would like each of you to do well. You can ignore that and just understand I, f I find it to be in my own interest. Okay? It's, it's important when, when you're dealing with someone like that, on, on a matter like that, to make sure where the interests lie. So, for example, if you had a piece of cake and two children, you can make sure that fairness is is ensured uh, by by pitting their interests against each other. You can say, "You, children A, ch child A, you cut the cake, and child B, you choose who gets which piece." Even even four year olds understand the score, <coughs> right? They 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 recognize both that it is fair, and they're going to get out the ruler and they're going to measure it, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Good. Let's go to the next thing. Functions. So a relation is a rule which maps elements of a set called domain to elements A set called the range. Okay. <clears throat> so, for example, this could be the domain. Perhaps the domain includes one, two, three, and triangle. I just throw that in there just so you don't have the mistaken impression that everything has to be a number. And how about um, five, eight, twelve, mm, five, eight, and twelve. Why not? So now what we need is to say what what one is related to. So I'll say that uh, one is related to say eight and twelve. Two is related to five. Triangle is related to all three of them because why not? And triangle just goes to 12. Okay. So, this is a relation. Uh, prototype example relation is um, um, something like who knows who. Like, uh, you know, Alice knows Charlie, and Charlie knows Bob, etc. That kind of thing. So, 
another example would be like Facebook, <laughs> for example. Right? This person is friends with those people. That person is friends with those people, etc. Another example would be Google, the 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 what Google computes. These pages link to those pages, etc. So Facebook and Google literally make a lot of money calculating and maintaining an up-to-date representation of the relationships among people in web pages, respectively. Okay. Um, we're not going to study relations in general in our class. Rather, we are interested in a specific kind of relation. So a function is a relation <clears throat> such that every element in the domain maps to exactly one element in the range. Now that's typical math language, but to say it a little more, you know, street language, I guess, would be to say you can have at most one arrow. You, there must be exactly one arrow leaving everything in the domain. You can't have multiple arrows leaving. So this is a relation. Is it a function? It's not. Because, for example, you can see two arrows leaving one and three arrows leaving three. So it must be the case that everything there's always one arrow leaving everything in the domain. So, for example, this a function? <laughs> so one of you is definitely <laughs> correct. <laughs> yes, but one element in the range, that means just talking about the domain, so it can be multiple elements in the range, but it's only one. Right. right. Yes. So yes, this is a function. It's a function because the rule visually, if you like, <coughs> you just have to have exactly one arrow leaving everything in the domain. So is exactly one arrow leaving all of these, each of these? Yeah. Now, you, you raise the point that, well, there's two arrows hitting four. I agree entirely. But the definition of a function is only talking about leaving the domain. So this is a function. And if you call this f, then I could write in a statement like this. Now, pronounced out loud, this is called f of 1. And what I'm asking is that supposing you put a 1 in on this side of the machine, what would come out on the other side? You put a 1 in, and out comes a 4. Similarly, if you put a 2 in, out comes a what? A 5. And then, sort of, finally, if you put a 3 in, out comes a 4. So now, this, this relation, this function, has the property that whenever you put something in, you know exactly what's going to come out. So for every input, there's an output. Yes. But now, imagine that you're over here on the other side of the machine, and it's a big machine, okay, and you can't see the input side, and you can't communicate with the person putting inputs on the input side. Suppose you saw a 5 come out. Do you know what was put in? If, if you knew the way the machine works. Yeah. They must have put in a 2, right? If you see a 5 come out, had to, had to have been a 2. 
Suppose you see a 4 come out. Do you know what was put in? You do not. Could have been a 1. Could have been a 3. So, now, you can imagine the scenario that, you know, you've got two people over here. One on the one side and the other on the other side. If this person puts a 2 in, then a 5 will come out. Well, if this person pushes the 5 back in, then <laughs> 2 comes out on the other side. But the machine can only run in reverse for that one. It can't run in reverse for that one, which is to say, if, because the machine can't remember anything. Suppose, suppose the person at the domain pushes a 1 through and out comes a 4. The person over here can't push the 4 back through because the machine doesn't know if, you're, if you want a 1 or a 3. Which is to say, take all these arrows and turn them around and call this one the domain and that one the range. Is the turned around, is the turned around object also a function? No, because the turned around one has two things leaving four. So it's a function going this way, but not going the other way. So I say that as a matter of foreshadowing, we're going to be interested in functions that can be turned around later. Okay, but for now, they only need to work one direction. Okay, and we'll talk more about this on Friday. So have a nice Wednesday.